Thank you. <coughs> um, so this is in part going to be about um, <coughs> the quantum error correcting codes uh, that we know how to construct um, <coughs> or don't always know how to construct from cubic complexes um, <coughs> plus um, <coughs> some recent work on construction, a particular family of uh, quantum LDPC codes uh, that fall into this, this family. There's, there have been some recent developments um, that I thought was really appropriate to talk to you um, <coughs> about in the context of, of, um, of this conference and this semester. <coughs> so, <coughs> um, <coughs> what are we talking about? So, uh, quantum error correcting codes. Um <coughs> For those of you who won't be too familiar with them, um, here's a quick crash course. Uh, we'll quickly get to the uh, combinatorics uh, uh <coughs> that we're interested in. So first, classical codes, we need to have in mind uh, how they work. Classical codes, quite simple. Uh, we're in the context of binary linear code, so we, we don't need large alphabets. and uh, <coughs> They're just um, linear spaces, so defined by a bunch of uh, equations. We like to group the equations that define the code um, in a matrix H called the parity check matrix of the code. So think of the code as defined by a bunch of equations uh, <coughs> like this. <coughs> and uh, two objects that uh, <coughs> we... Um, want to keep in mind the, the syndrome function that will be very important um, <coughs> it takes any vector in the Hamming space from 0 1 to the n and uh, <coughs> multiplies it by the uh, parity check matrix uh, H so the syndrome basically tells you um, <coughs> for any vector what equation is satisfied what equation is is not satisfied so we can think of the code is uh, the set of vectors that have zero um, <coughs> syndrome. And uh, later we'll think of the syndrome function as a, as, as a boundary um, in a more typological uh, context. <coughs> and the, one of the main parameters, that the parameter that <coughs> differentiates, if you want, um, coding theory from linear algebra is, is the distance parameter, so the minimal distance of a code is the smallest Hamming weight of a code word. And, and think of it this way, it's the um, <coughs> smallest uh, weight of a vector with uh, zero syndrome. So think of vectors as potential error vectors. Um <coughs> minimal distance, uh, it's good to think of it as the smallest weight of a non-detectable uh, error. So now, quantum codes. So I'll be talking about CSS quantum codes uh, for Calderbank, Shaw, Steen. Um, <coughs> uh, they're not the most uh, general uh, <coughs> family of quantum codes, but they're the ones we'll be talking about. <coughs> uh, so really, you can think of them as two classical codes. Uh, in, in the quantum world, there are two families of uh, um, errors that we need to uh, uh, correct for technical reasons called X errors, Z errors. And you can think of them simply as ordinary um, <coughs> binary errors, just they, they come from different physical errors and, and we need the two codes uh, to correct both sets of, uh, of errors. Now, there's an important technicality is that the two parity check matrices that define your quantum codes um, <coughs> have to have orthogonal rows. Uh, so the row space of the two matrices HX and HZ have to be orthogonal. Um, <coughs> that has something to do with being able to measure syndromes in, in the quantum world. 
um, <clears throat> so, um, um, an important fact that we'll keep in mind is that um, <clears throat> with this technicality, uh, we're allowed to measure syndrome. So, never mind where the actual the, the errors, the binary errors, um, actually come from. They come from the quantum world, which I don't want to describe. <clears throat> um, otherwise, we won't be getting into the combinatorics. Um, <clears throat> We're able to measure uh, both sets of, of syndromes, but for this to be possible, again, never mind why, we need uh, those two row spaces to be orthogonal. <coughs> um, the dimension of the quantum code is whatever is left when you remove the dimensions of the row spaces of Hx and Hz. This is very much like in the... Uh, classical case, uh, <clears throat> once you remove uh, all independent uh, linear equations that define the codes, then what you're left with, uh, if you have n coordinates, is uh, the dimension of the code. <clears throat> um, the second important technicality that we need to keep in mind is that um, <clears throat> error vectors in the row space of one of the two matrices, say H, Z, <coughs> they will naturally, because they're orthogonal to the row space of Hx, they naturally belong to the classical code defined by Hx. So they have zero syndrome. And they're themselves non-zero. But they actually don't count. If, if these errors occur, they don't bother us. The, the technical reason is that they don't modify the uh, quantum state that we're trying to protect, never mind <coughs> what it actually is. <coughs> um, so the, the real errors uh, that bother us and that we can't uh, detect because they have zero syndrome, um <coughs> they're zero syndrome errors, so for one of the two codes <coughs> that are not in the row space of the parity check matrix of the other code. So <clears throat> first code gives us one syndrome. Um, <clears throat> the, the errors that bother us, once again, um, <clears throat> have zero syndrome for this code. Uh, sigma x is uh, zero, but not um, <clears throat> if, if it's in the row space um, of the other parity check matrix, uh, we don't mind. So the minimum distances um, <coughs> that count for us, uh, there are two of them because we have two codes. <coughs> and uh, each distance is defined like this. It's the minimum uh, weight of a code word, which is not in the row space of the parity check matrix of the other codes, if you prefer, which is not in the dual code of the second code. So dx and dz, and the overall minimum distance of the code is the minimum uh, <coughs> of both these distances. Um, <coughs> you can view your quantum code um, as, as a chain complex. It just uh, changes the um, language. So uh, to find two boundary operators, one is really going to be the uh, syndrome. Uh, for one of the codes, multiply, mul it's multiplication by Hx. And uh, <coughs> the other one is going to be multiplication by Hz transpose. And, and since uh, <coughs> the row spaces of our two matrices, Hx and Hz, are orthogonal, it exactly means that composing these two delta <coughs> operators give you zero. So we've just defined. Um, a chain complex. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> in this language, um, <clears throat> the uh, two minimum distances that we've just uh, defined, they're the smallest weights of um, <clears throat> homologically, so we look at homology in the middle, and um 
what we have are two distances are the smallest weight of the um, <coughs> of a homologically non-trivial cycle, and for the other code, it translates into the smallest weight of um, a co-homologically non-trivial co-cycle. So you have to do it in, in both directions? Yes. Twice? Yes. Um, <coughs> yes, we can write the, the, the same thing with the arrows uh, <coughs> in, in the other direction and uh, changing the, the transpose uh, here. Okay. Um, <coughs> So <coughs> LDPC codes, With, without any extra requirements, uh, there's a lot of literature on um, quantum CSS codes. There are asymptot asymptotically good uh, families of quantum codes, meaning with uh, rate di dimension divided by n that <coughs> um, is uh, low bounded by a constant, uh, relative minimum distance, which also, well, um, <coughs> is bounded from below by a con constant uh, minimum distance which grows linearly in n. Uh, but uh, for a number of reasons, we're interested in LDPC codes, which means that both our matrices HX and um, HZ are low density. Um, <coughs> there are both theoretical and practical reasons uh, that I don't really want to dwell upon. Um, <clears throat> why we should be interested in, in these codes in the quantum uh, setting, but presently uh, <clears throat> that's probably uh, <clears throat> the, the quantum coding area where the most exciting research is going on. <clears throat> and here the situation is, is much more... I just have... Uh <clears throat> Uh, low, okay, um, I didn't. <laughs> so low density uh, means that both our matrices uh, in the strict case have uh, constant weight uh, rows. And the codes that I'll be looking at um, <clears throat> have low density and slightly weak ascent. The, the weight of the rows will be allowed to grow very slowly like a log of, uh, of of n of the block length. Um, <coughs> um, okay, we could argue about this uh, requirement. Uh, <coughs> the codes that we'll be talking about uh, will have low weights both for rows and and, and columns. Um, so, so, one more thing. so, if you yes. take uh, codes and you try to repeat his argument, what goes wrong? Well, what goes wrong is that <coughs> Gallagher's codes are, are too good. Um, <coughs> what goes wrong is that if you take one parity check matrix uh, <coughs> to define an LDPC uh, um, code, the code that comes with it is, is typically too good. It's, uh, it has a large minimum distance. And that means that in the dual of HX, we have no small weight code words at all. But we need small weight code words to put in the other matrix. So the H says it. Tells you that you cannot do. Yes. So that's the challenge. All, all these random methods that work so well in the classical case, they collapse completely in the quantum case. Uh, because uh, we need to find ways of constructing simultaneously both those uh, low density you matrices. Randomly plot these codes and ask what their distance is. Right. <coughs> um, <coughs> so, uh, very mysterious um <coughs> what is the largest possible minimum distance with this LDPC uh, requirement? So, records. Uh, <coughs> uh, basically, we find it very difficult to get beyond uh, square root of n. So, the square root of n is the best known uh, <coughs> for codes with constant rate. And if you forget, if you forget about the rate, you just want to get 
the minimum distance to be as high as possible, um, <coughs> um, one can go a little above um, <coughs> square root of n, but by this uh, log n type uh, factor. Um, <coughs> And uh, I'll be talking a little about um, <coughs> local uh, testability, which means um, trying to relate the syndrome weight to the uh, error, error rate. Wait, yes? Uh, what is the rate in Kaufman scale? Um, <coughs> asymptotically, it's, it's zero. Um <coughs> What the dimension is exactly relative to n, uh, that eludes me. You cannot uh, put better than log n. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> not the best, uh, yes. Uh, it's not that embarrassing, actually, from the minimum distance uh, point of view. And, and um, <coughs> uh, Actually, I'm going to talk about uh, quantum codes of dimension one. So <coughs> I'm even more embarrassed in a sense. Um, so the most famous uh, quantum LDPC code, um, <coughs> Kitai Story code. Um, so we've said that we can think of a um, quantum CSS code is, is uh, chain complex. So one way of constructing them is taking good old uh, actual cell complexes and, and using their homology. So <coughs> one of the simplest ways uh, to do this is to take a tiling of a torus. Uh, so here's this grid. Imagine that we identify um, <coughs> the, the outside edges of the large square here, uh, parallel edges are identified. So we get a nice uh, regular graph of degree 4. And uh, <coughs> the first matrix, Hx, uh, <coughs> is made up of the characteristic vectors of these elementary co-cycles. Um, <coughs> Hz is made up of the <coughs> um, elementary uh, faces, um, <coughs> four cycles, if you want, um, <coughs> of this grid, and they're naturally uh, orthogonal to each other. <coughs> uh, the dimension, well, it's the dimension of the uh, homology. So uh, for the torus, uh, it's uh, two. <coughs> and um, <coughs> the non-trivial cycles uh, look like this. They're the ones that wrap around the torus. <coughs> and, and the co-cycles look like little ladders like this. And they're actually cycles in the dual uh, complex, <coughs> uh, which is isomorphic to the uh, original uh, <coughs> complex, which is quite uh, convenient. So writing down everything, the parameters uh, look like this. And, and we have a minimum distance that grows like a square root um, <coughs> of uh, the length. Um, so this is Kitaev's code. Um, <coughs> um, <coughs> um, one of the most um, studied codes. There are a lot of works on how to decode it efficiently, a uh, number of variants. Uh, implementation issues that I don't want to talk about. <coughs> um, <coughs> so uh, here's a variation of the uh, Kitaev code. Um, <coughs> suppose we use this this slight variation of uh, the tiling. We we just uh, twist it. So. <coughs> Our original tiling we could think of as a Cayley graph or defined over a Cayley graph uh, for which the group was uh, <coughs> z over mz squared with the 
natural uh, generators of Z2. But <clears throat> instead, we could take a different quotient of Z2. Um, <clears throat> we could take uh, <clears throat> a quotient by the lattice lambda generated uh, by these two vectors. And, oops. <clears throat> Um, and this improves the minimum distance by a square root of 2 factor because when you go from <coughs> one edge of the square to the other, you're forced to uh, uh, <coughs> have your paths follow zigzag uh, like this. Um, <coughs> so, um, <coughs> and, and that's the best that happens to be the best variation uh, of the Kitaev code from the minimum distance uh, point of view. Um, <clears throat> I'll come back to this twist uh, in, in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> so what else can you do? You can raise the uh, dimension. Um, <clears throat> so Instead of uh, having a two-dimensional grid, you, you could use a three-dimensional grid or an n-dimensional grid. So in, in three dimensions, the underlying um, <coughs> uh, tiling looks like this. And, and two cycles uh, will look like this. You will slice through the tiling like this. And uh, <coughs> this is going to be hom homologically non-trivial uh, two cycles. <clears throat> so three dimensions is something you don't want too much because when we go to the dual complex um, <clears throat> or the cohomology, if you prefer, um, <clears throat> the the you will really have one-dimensional objects. Once more, you really want to go to dimension uh, four to potentially gain something. Uh, but I didn't have the stamina to draw a tiling of the uh, four-dimensional cube. <coughs> um, this is enough to convey the idea. And you could ask the same question, um, <coughs> which is, um, <coughs> if you want to define a toric code in, in four dimensions, um, what is the best uh, way to do it from the minimum distance point of view, which means um, what is the best lattice lambda that you can choose. And uh, that seems to be the uh, lattice generated by the, um, <coughs> this, the, these four vectors of a Heydemar um, matrix for which uh, you will gain a factor <coughs> 2 <coughs> over uh, the natural tiling of the uh, torus. Now, more generally, as you raise the dimension... Um, <clears throat> but, but this tiling B with respect to N is not any more square root. It's less than square root. Uh, slightly. The constant is but slightly uh, degraded. You earn something by the two, but you lose something. Yes. So you still earn something. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you get very close to the minimum distance of the uh, original of the optimized Kitaev two-dimensional uh, code, but overall it's slightly worse. Slightly worse But then the dimension of the code is six instead of two, so... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, you potentially have other advantages. Um, actually, I don't know how to prove this rigorously. Um, I'm willing to bet it is, but um, <coughs> um, um, it, it's probably provable, not that difficult to prove. But uh, if you're going to add more dimensions, then it's really going to be uh, very challenging to figure out um, <clears throat> what the best possible lattice is um, from 
that's a, uh, okay, that's an open question. And uh, which was in part investigated by Hastings uh, a couple of years ago. And um, his argument is that if you define a quantum code like this, so the, the, once again, the idea is this. You take this uh, um, <coughs> cubic uh, lattice, z2 to the n. You're going to put homology um, bang in the middle. So coordinates are going to be supported by uh, n cells, right? And you have to make this into finite uh, complex. So you have to take the quotient by something. Um, <coughs> so take some lattice uh, with, with some uh, volume, which will <coughs> uh, give you code. And um, <coughs> um, Hastings argues that uh, what you expect is uh, the minimum distance to be governed by a Rankine invariant of uh, your lattice, which really means um, <coughs> the smallest possible volume of a sub lattice uh, generated by um, <coughs> the right number of, of vectors. So two in this case, and more generally n in, in um, the length 2n case. Um, so Hastings' interesting point is that if this were to be true, um, <coughs> when, when you let the dimension go to infinity, um, then <coughs> what he did is he made some computations for um, Rankine invariants of random uh, lattices <coughs> and found that, that they're so good, these uh, random Rankine invariants, that if it's true that uh, <coughs> they will really govern the minimum distance uh, of the quantum code, then we will get quantum code with a min minimum distance which breaks the square root of n bound and actually goes almost to uh, linear in n. But it's a big if, uh, <coughs> because uh, the, the dimension uh, <coughs> um, has to grow uh, sufficiently fast compared to the length of the code. <coughs> uh, experiments or, or some concrete thing you found something? Or? Uh, no, experiments are almost impossible to do uh, because uh, when the, dim the dimension has to go has 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 to grow quickly, and and the length of your quantum code is going to be completely unmanageable. Uh, so if, if the result is true, then uh, it's, it's from huge, huge lengths, really. And you will see the phenomenon uh, for astronom astronomical lengths, really. Um, <coughs> Can you forget to be stated in a mathematical way, uh, in a precise mathematical way? Or? Yes. Uh, <coughs> um, um, okay, so I didn't want to do this because so uh, <laughs> it, it requires introducing a lot of notation, but um, the, the idea behind the conjecture is, is really this. You, you want the Rankine invariance of your lattice uh, to govern the minimum behavior of the minimum distance. Um, <coughs> so th this sort of... Um, um <coughs> Spurned interest on what quantum codes uh, we can come up with um, based on cubes of uh, high dimension. And uh, with uh, Anthony Le Verrier and, and Vivian Lund, we looked at the uh, following quantum code. So, how is it going to be uh, defined? Start with a good old uh, Hamming cube, 0, 1 to the n. Um, <coughs> and what, what we really want to do is uh, play with uh, uh, the, the natural complex that comes with it and, and look at ho homology somewhere in the middle. 
Now, if we don't, to, to get non-zero homology, we have to take a quotient of the cube, of the cube because um, <coughs> homology is, is zero. It's topologically, it's a sphere, right? <coughs> so one of the simplest things uh, you can do is simply oppose, identify opposing uh, vertices. <coughs> so one of the ideas was uh, to use the simplest possible quotient uh, in a way, and, and arguably the one that um, <coughs> uses the is fewer, the, the, the smallest possible number of identifications in a way. And so uh, that's a natural way of doing it. Uh, so we do this. We just identify opposing uh, uh, vertices. So <coughs> this will give us non-trivial uh, homology. And so uh, you can see that we're really constructing a discrete model of uh, real projective uh, space, right? <coughs> so as such, um, <coughs> we're going to get uh, quantum codes uh, of dimension one, because that's F2 homology of real projective space uh, for every code defined on K faces. So dimension one, OK, it's not very much. But <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, it gives you um, the, the simplicity of dimension one helps uh, investigate all sorts of, uh, of, of phenomena. Uh, so this is going to be the length uh, of the code. So for a parameter k, uh, parameter k is when you use k faces, uh, k cells if you want to support coordinates. <coughs> um, <coughs> so um, <coughs> um, <coughs> okay, n equals three. Um, that was uh, an example of a uh, <coughs> smallest uh, weight cycle. And if we want a smallest weight co-cycle, um, here it is. <coughs> so this little example gives us three for one minimum distance, two for the other. And then the natural question is, um <coughs> uh, what is dx in, in dz in general. Um, <coughs> well, the theorem is this. Uh, there's a asymmetric behavior of both codes. So one of the minimum distance is the binomial coefficient and choose k, and the other one is the remaining power of 2 that you get, so that when you multiply both of them together, you have length n. So if you choose um, k to be somewhere in the middle to make both your distances uh, <coughs> close to each other, you again are going to have a minimum, minimum distance behavior for the overall quantum code, uh, which is close to uh, square root of n. Um, <coughs> so um, that's, <coughs> depending on how you look at it, um, <coughs> Not super good news if one were hoping uh, to break the square root of n uh, barrier in this way. Um, possibly it uh, sheds little doubt on Hastings' conjecture. I'll leave you to uh, uh <coughs> decide what you want to believe. <coughs> um, proving. Uh, this result is actually uh, uh, rather fun. And um, <coughs> I'll, I'll just give you a quick walkthrough uh, of the proof, uh, because it involves an argument that we don't use very often when computing minimum distance of uh, quantum codes. Um, <coughs> so typically, when we want to low bound on the minimum distance of a uh, uh, quantum code defined by some complex or some quantum LDPC code, um, 
typically we, we um, look at a, an area of the complex, uh, a ball for example, um, <clears throat> and argue that if the ball is sufficiently small or not too big, um, then it's isomorphic um, <clears throat> to um, a ball or an area in the original complex uh, that you've chosen before taking a quotient. <clears throat> Joe, can, yes? can I back up a little bit? Sure. Or maybe more than a little bit. Basically, this is ruling out the possibility of breaking sort of a barrier in homological quantum codes of a particular type. Is that true? Um, <laughs> If, if the answer is yes, then I, I don't understand what's the particular type. What's the restricted set of codes that you're talking about? So the restricted set of codes that I'm talking about is uh, <coughs> <coughs> that we take a cubic uh, complex, and uh, <coughs> so that is part of uh, Z to the N, if you want, <coughs> and uh, take some quotient and use that complex to define uh, the quantum code. Um, now, <coughs> whether the fact that this particular complex um, <coughs> doesn't break the square root of n barrier uh, means that it, it doesn't formally disprove that you can't break the square root of n barrier by taking other quotients of uh, z to the, to the n. This is Hastings' conjecture you can actually do it. And, and this code, this complex, the quotient, does, it doesn't have the same topology uh, <clears throat> as uh, the one suggested by uh, Hastings, which are really uh, topologically tori instead of uh, projecting space. So, <clears throat> um, um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is for the projected space construction. This is the projected space construction. Uh, <clears throat> Intuition, well, <clears throat> might tell you that <clears throat> if this doesn't work, then it's not very good news, but <clears throat> uh, it doesn't formally rule out uh, other clever occasions of said to said to the end um, <clears throat> okay um, <clears throat> so what I was trying to say is that um, usually to get low bound on the minimum distance <clears throat> we, we do this uh, we look at a, a sphere or, or some part of the quotient complex and say it's isomorphic to the original complex where there's zero homology. And <clears throat> in the original complex, every cycle is a sum of boundaries and every co-cycle is a sum of co-boundaries. And so that has to happen in the quotient as well. <clears throat> but <clears throat> here, um, we really use a, th there's a different neat argument uh, to give us the exact uh, minimum distances. And uh, <clears throat> let me give you an idea. Um, so <clears throat> th these are notations, uh, reasonably natural notation for um, <clears throat> k-chains. Um, so <clears throat> think of a, a k-cell. Uh, it's really a little subcube, uh, right? So this is naturally natural notation for a <clears throat> subcube. The stars tell you that this is where you, you <clears throat> um, have your, <clears throat> your your subcube. You can replace the uh, stars by all possible values of, of zeros and one. Um, <clears throat> the the um, <clears throat> non-trivial Co-cycles of smallest possible weight, they're, they're the easiest to, uh, uh, to guess. Um, <clears throat> uh, really, this is what you want to do. Uh, <clears throat> fix stars in the set of positions 
and let almost everything else um, <coughs> be 0 and 1. Um, <coughs> OK, uh, this is for co-cycles. Uh, for the moment, it's just a guess. <coughs> and two, <coughs> you want to figure out what the cycles are. They're, they're more difficult to guess by just uh, <coughs> writing uh, messing about with uh, stars and zeros and ones. But you notice that um, <coughs> n choose k is just the number of ways of putting k stars in n positions. So you're guessing that a minimum weight k cycle should have exactly um, <coughs> one um, k cell corresponding to every orientation, by which I mean every choice of placing stars in k positions. And once you guess that, <coughs> you try to construct examples. And there's a neat um, recursive uh, construction. Here's one way of highlighting the uh, connection to binomial coefficients. So <coughs> one star, so for, for one cell's edges, it's easy to figure out what such a cycle is. You just go from one vertex to the opposing vertex. <coughs> it's slightly more difficult to figure out what it becomes uh, for k faces, but there's this neat recursive uh, formula. And then, <coughs> once you have those, uh, the, the neat argument, and dimension one kind of helps, but uh, there are generalizations of this argument to dimensions more than one. Um, <coughs> you argue like this. Um, <coughs> homologically non-trivial cycles and hom co-homologically non-trivial co-cycles, they actually have to be orthogonal. Because <coughs> if they're not, you don't have sufficiently many dimensions in the whole uh, <coughs> uh, space uh, to, to fit them in. So, in particular, the supports of a non-trivial cycle and non-trivial co-cycle, they always have to intersect. Now, we've exhibited a bunch of cycles, non-trivial cycles and co-cycles, uh, <coughs> That are actually. This is something you argue if you explain in general or only a specific example that. Uh, yeah, th that's, in, that's true every time you have dimension one. Oh. To generalize it to more than dimension one, uh, you can also. Yeah, you can also do it, but the statement is more complicated. I don't want to state what it's going to be. Um, <clears throat> Right, so <clears throat> um, basically the argument is that a cycle has to intersect many co-cycles that we've exhibited, and that forces the weight to be at least something. And if we um, <clears throat> do the computation uh, precisely, we get the low bounds given by exactly the quantities that we've computed here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so from the point of view of minimum distance, uh, well, it's rather neat and cute to go through the combinatorics of this uh, uh, specific code and figure out the minimal weight cycles and co-cycles that are kind of non-obvious. But <clears throat> from the purely quantum code and point of view, point of view, it's maybe a failure. We don't break the square root of n barrier, <coughs> uh, dimension is only one. But <coughs> uh, high dimensions uh, <coughs> um, lead to other properties. And um <coughs> one interesting application is uh, <coughs> a form of local testability, uh, which is a concept introduced by a Horonov 
um, <clears throat> in, in the quantum coding uh, context. And uh, basically, the idea, <clears throat> the code is going to be locally testable if looking at the syndrome, <clears throat> if, if the syndrome weight will tell you what the weight of the error is. In a nutshell, that's what it is. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the property that you want is that if you take a syndrome, so with our terminology, it's a boundary or a co-boundary, <clears throat> um, which is uh, th then the syndrome of some error, then it should be the syndrome <clears throat> of an error of weight at most constant times, the weight of the syndrome. So in, in uh, <clears throat> more topological language, boundaries and co-boundaries uh, of our complexes should have fillings of a similar size. Now the current record uh, <clears throat> for codes that don't come from cubic complexes but are similar in the sense that they also, that they're weakly LDPC, they have um, um, parity check matrices um, <clears throat> of row weight log n and column weight also uh, log n. Uh, the, the best known was 1 over log n squared. And it turns out that um, <clears throat> this projective code achieves 1 over log n. At least that's what we were able to prove. And um, I'm kind of running out of time. I'll skip this. Um, <clears throat> so our theorem is something like this. So <clears throat> here's the constant that we managed to put in front um, <clears throat> of our boundaries and co-boundaries. Never mind its actual value. It behaves like 1 over log of the length, <clears throat> uh, which is the new record, if you want. And what is kind of frustrating um, is that we don't know whether that's uh, the best possible or not. So open question is whether this code achieves actually a constant uh, C here or not. Um, <clears throat> I, one way or the other, I don't know which is uh, true. Um, <clears throat> we used uh, an inductive uh, method that was used in Dottera's um, uh, thesis to compute the minimum sizes of fillings in the ordinary cube. But the method uh, <clears throat> doesn't work so well after identification. Uh, actually, we need to change the method somewhat and we lose something and we lose the constant size fillings. Um, and so uh, we couldn't come up with examples which say that this is the best uh, we can do. We couldn't come up with a different method which would work better. better. So <clears throat> um, this is arguably uh, an interesting problem in, in its own right, because um, <clears throat> if once you've been interested in the cubic complex, um, <clears throat> um, it's reasonable thing to do to look at what happens uh, after just identification of opposing uh, vertices. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so uh, that's um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the open question that we hit um, <clears throat> when we um, um <clears throat> consider this complex of this uh, <coughs> um, family of quantum codes. <coughs> um, I'm kind of out of time, so <coughs> um, <coughs> I'll more or less stop here. To the best of my knowledge, um, that covers uh, all attempts of constructing quantum codes from cubic complexes, so quotients of Zn in high dimensions. Uh, I don't know of any uh, <clears throat> other attempts. Um, so 
I'll leave you to decide whether this is a interesting avenue uh, for further research uh, or not. Is it the way to go, or should we really look at different complexes to um, <coughs> hope have reasonable hope of getting um, <coughs> substantial improvements over what's known? Um, certainly, if one wants to look at Strongly LDPC codes, well, we can't do it with uh, too big complexes. Um, <laughs> but allowing log, log n weights makes for slightly easier problems. Um, <clears throat> I could say a few words about decoding uh, uh, the, this protective code, which is rather uh, fun, but <clears throat> I'm out of time, so I'll leave, leave it at that. Thank you. <clears throat>